what is up guys welcome back to the channel guys we got an interesting one here somebody recommended this to me like 20 times kid you not um but interesting one of course dealing with music we got flat pack pop sweden's music miracle we checking this out this is like a this is an hour 59 minutes but it's you know close to an hour i'm gonna have to split this up in parts because this is long so uh i might do about 10 15 a minute to see now if it's interesting i'm gonna still stop it at 10 to 15 but if it's interesting i'll just finish the rest another time but uh of course we, we talking about swedish music so it gotta be very interesting uh shout out to whoever sent this i don't think they had a name when they put it on my google form but i counted at least 10 i over exaggerated that 20 it had to be at least 10 times though but let's check it out this oh, is the story BBC original. of the sound of modern pop my name is james Bellardi. I'm a music journalist, and when I was a teenager in the 1990s, modern pop was in its infancy. It was a time when aspiring singers became more and more reliant on teams of songwriters to stand any chance of reaching the top of the charts. That's how it was, for sure. Crazy. Oh, Britney, modern baby. pop was the sound of school discos, Saturday morning television, and my big bye, sister's bye. bedroom. <laughs> I'd always assumed it was written in London, or New York, or LA. But in reality, a staggering proportion of the biggest hits from the last 30 years have actually been crafted last 30 in this years, cold, crazy. dark corner of Northern Europe called Sweden. I got the eye uh, of the Katy Perry. Okay, Today, Katy. what we know to be modern the weekend. pop is actually a smorgasbord of melodic minimalism, epic that Bieber hooks fever? and drops. Melancholy, euphoria, okay. mathematical algorithms, and Scandinavian folklore. Now, Nicki Minaj, I think. I ain't gonna lie, they like just jumping into Swedish music. I was like, dang. Especially Max Martin. There's a video I'm gonna have to check out. Max Martin, all his hits through the years. That was like 20 minutes too. It's a 20 minute video, but I'm gonna check that out next. Cause that's crazy. The hits he done wrote. Taylor Swift. How did this pop come to dominate our charts without us even knowing <laughs> where chart. it came from? It's a tale that begins with one man's dream of sonic perfection, and it ends with Sweden becoming a global musical superpower. Believe it or not, this place is the biggest exporter of pop music per capita of any country on the planet. Oh, snap. In the Keep 1990s, nice a visionary band of Swedish songwriters and producers staged a coup on the global charts that would change pop music forever. In this film, I'll be examining the tracks crazy. that turn Sweden into an unstoppable musical force, meeting the masterminds responsible oh. for the most potent melodies of our time, the vowel vowel. understanding the last three decades of pop through the myths and legends of the land of the midnight sun. Hey. So what can we learn about a country from the popular music that it produces? The lyrics might tell us something about the hopes and dreams of its population. The rhythm and the melody might give a sense of the mood within a nation's My God, borders. when it's the coldest time, also too. clues in the way that the music is produced and crucially, who it is being made for. Sweden's okay. musical revolution began when club culture arrived in the 1980s. A time when Swedes found an escape from the country's notoriously bitter winter notorious. evenings. At the heart of the musical underground was the Ritz nightclub, quite literally Ritz. underground in a subway station in a working Dang. class district of Stockholm. My boy haircut, he looked like Drago out there. The fight Rocky. Amongst the DJs at the Ritz was the blonde mulleted dog Voller. He and the Doc other Ritz Waller. DJs had heard, heard the latest remixes pumping out of the US and UK. Very Swedishly, they didn't so much think that they could do better, just rearrange the songs in a more Swedish mm. way. They formed Swemix, a record label Swemix. pumping out its own I remixes, like more finely attuned to Stockholm's clubbers. 
It was kind of like a music collective. And it was like a big family. People came in, hey, you want to throw down a rap? We wanted to be New Yorkers. We sort of tried to fit into that, you know, like, we're good too. I feel like they're not different from the rest of the world, especially in these days. I feel like everybody was trying to get to New York or somewhere. I feel like New York was a big music scene. Everybody was trying to get to New York Man, back then. That's why we have this slightly American accent. <laughs> This is the original Sweemix studio. Stonebridge Sweemix. was also one of Sweemix's founding DJs. Along with office manager Jeanette von der Berg, he took me to see the company's Dang. former studio. The facility is comfortable. Oh yeah, they really in the. <laughs> no, they had. They like really a, in the. They really in the trenches, Rudy. Really. The facility is comfortable. <laughs> no, they had like a bed spread or something hanging to take down the sounds. And the singing Dang. booth was just a corridor. And we had to stop singing when someone flushed. Wow. What do you mean flushed? When someone flushed the toilet. It was that loud. That's crazy. Sweemix aimed to capture the sound of the Stockholm underground. But Doug Voller had other ideas. Doug Voller. He wanted to make music that was popular with the masses. And he made his intentions clear when he decided to change his name. Doug's new moniker, Dennis Pop, would go against everything that the other Sweemix DJs stood for. I mean, Dennis Pop, we were scandalized that the guy picked Dennis Pop because you could not mention mm. the word Pop. It was like, stop the knock, you know, you definitely not. But Dennis, he knew what the people liked. Mm. The key to Sweemix's success was its unashamedly that like democratic approach. The remixes that got the best reception in the Ritz nightclub were released on white label vinyl. Dang. And Stockholm's club has proved to be a surprisingly reliable barometer Robin of is. taste. I've heard this. Earlier, song, that song jams. Song. I think I heard this when I was little. Robin S had released the song "Show Me Love," and it sank without a trace. Show me love. After a sprinkling of Sweemix Stardust, Stonebridge's remix of "Show Me Love" would propel Robin that S that into the U.S. and U.K. top ten. Dang! We took melody tradition from the U.K. We took like beats from America. Oh, that's funky. Little reverb. Sweet mix. And I added two chords. Doom, 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 doom. And I basically mixed it down turning them into something Swedish, you know. Dang, that's dope. And then it just exploded. Hey, I definitely heard it. Stonebridge remix. Dang. In our heads, that's different, that's different. very Swedish, we also make it very appealing to other nations. But Dennis Pop's ambitions that for was mass a appeal jammer. meant going well beyond simply improving songs that had been written by others. He knew he'd have to write his own music, perfect pop music, in order mm. to enchant the widest possible audience. I was more interested in cool things, you know, like jazzy, funky. Whereas for Dennis, the challenge was to create the perfect pop song. He never thought twice about cool, you know. Actually, if it was cool, it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Dennis Pop and the Stockholm Underground were about to receive an icy Stockholm blast of Scandi folk reggae fusion from the country's north, courtesy of Ace of Bass. Ace Not of Bass. Abba, the band consisted of two captivating female singers, backed by two blokes. Two it was blokes. my brother, my sister, and and actually my former boyfriend. So that was like, wow, <laughs> wow, what a crowd. We came from a very simple town called Gothenburg. Okay, and Gothenburg. Sent a lot of cassettes posted it to the, the record labels all over. For Ace of Bass, getting noticed by Dennis Pop was a stroke of good fortune owed to a dodgy car stereo. Well, uh, my name is Dennis Pop. I got a cassette sent to my house saying, please listen to our demos and uh, call us. Eventually, Dang. Tape have got to Dennis. He took, put it in his car. Gonna got stuck, so I kept hearing it every time. <laughs> I, in the car, I kept hearing the same song. Dang. At that time was meant called to Mr. Be. Ace. I'm Mr. Ace. I'm running my base. 1991. So he was actually stuck with our tape for over six months. Whether he wanted it. Yeah. Anyway. So when we call them yeah you know as dennis has actually wanted to be in contact with you for a while but wow. he's occupied now he's in the studio with the dentist 
and we were like, with the dentist. So frustrated. We finally found the guy we wanted to work with. What was he doing with the dentist when you have these four great guys and girls Miss from Dr. Al- Isn't it Dr. Alban right here? So I think this dentist was Dr. Alban. Dr. Alban was a local Nigerian dentist with a sideline in rapping. It's my life. Y'all say Dr. Alban be jamming. After spotting Alban performing on Stockholm's club circuit, Dennis saw a route from the underground to the mainstream. Dang. Jag skulle ju kunna vänta lite längre innan du säger det här. Make this world a better place. Att du drar ut lite längre på det så att det kommer lite senare. Okej. Då tycker du att det är fel eller vad då? Nej, det är inte fel. Det bara att det ska bli lite mer häng så att det svänger okay. lite. All right, all right. Få höra en gång i micken bara. Few could have predicted Dang. that Dr. Alban's obvious natural talent with the mic, coupled with Dennis's keen ear for a hit sound, would be such an explosive combination. Oh, I had to it's take that one now. Kind of jamming. Europe, reaching number one in seven <laughs> countries. <laughs> and Dang. it was thanks to a legendary advert that the track broke in the UK, peaking at number Tam two pack. in the charts. It's not only more discreet, but it's That's crazy. That makes it even easier to use. <laughs> Uh, anything will do. Anything will do. Why compromise? That's funny. Meanwhile, Ace of Base had been waiting patiently. After five months, they finally had a call from Dennis Pop. The band's raw demo was about to be transformed into an international smash hit. Dennis had Dang. his idea what he wanted to do with it to make it work on the dance floor. Dennis had learned at the Ritz nightclub that the simplest melodies, choruses and hooks had the biggest impact on the crowd. All he had to do was convince the band of his musical vision. He said that we have to cut the rap out of it. And he's like, well, then we cut the rap. Kill your own darlings. If it's a <laughs> crap. It's a very... All that After she stripping wants. out the non-essentials, Dennis had turned Ace of Bass's Gothenburg he said, Y'all not into rappers. a phenomenon. All that she wants thundered to number one in 13 countries, including the UK. In the United mm. States, it peaked at number two. Nice. Perhaps most remarkable of all is that no one seemed to mind the song's puzzling lyrics. What was they baby saying? for us is obviously is not a baby like this. <laughs> She's a manhunter. She's looking for happiness, and uh, she actually gets less and less happy. And so the baby is another man in her life. At that time. Did you know that to English ears that would sound a bit weird? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, it didn't matter uh, too much to us because we thought it sounded good. People have said that English is the biggest language in the world, but I would say that the bad English is the biggest language in the world. <laughs> bad because English. that's the way you talk On in English when you travel or writing emails. As a Swede, you don't realize that lyrics like baby one more time or that you want doesn't make sense because from our perspective, we assume that is the way you talk. Yeah. An applause for Dennis Pop. Dennis Pop. Dennis was now on his way to becoming the most successful Swedish musical sensation since ABBA. Dang. I feel like this Ace is the first time I heard about his name. Had become the fastest selling debut album of all time, shifting 25 million copies worldwide. Yeah, dang. But in ultra equal Sweden, Dennis knew that it's rarely wise to trumpet one's own achievements. Har du blivit lika rik då som Ace of Base och Dr. Alvin? Jag har pengar. Jag har ingen sån. Good response. Jag har inte pengar direkt utan jag tycker mer för mig är kicken, men, kicken för mig det är att veta liksom, ja, här har vi, jag har gjort en låt och just nu är det två tre miljoner fötter som dansar till den här låten mm. ikväll och det har jag gjort i en källa det ger mig humble. fullständig tillfredsställelse det här med pengar det kommer liksom det kommer sen my guy humble he it's all about the music the passion it was the relationship with the spotlight of success Dennis wasn't just content being the backroom guy he actually preferred it it was the ideal solution to detract from the embarrassment of his newfound wealth. Dang. Back at Sweemix, the other DJs felt Dennis's quest for mass appeal undermined their cool image. The uneasy truce between Pop and the Underground finally broke down. Spurred on by what he had achieved, Dennis's next venture was Shayron Studios. Shayron. Here, he would recruit an elite band of eight disciples that would change the world of pop Uh-oh, forever. there go Max. Each one was to be molded in his image, 
tasked with practicing his musical doctrine. Wow. The first disciple was Tottenham-born rapper Herbie Critchlow. Having grown up in Barbados, meeting Dennis Pop was an mm. unforgettable experience. You're in tropical Barbados, yeah. and you end up in snowy, freezing, cold stomach. <laughs> it was weird. I mean, you remember, I came from paradise. You know, uh, technically. <laughs> the hot sun and surfing on the beach, and wake up one morning, I'm in a freezer. <laughs> he looked like he's freezing right night, there. Man, I was walking around town and had this weird feeling. Go in that place over there and go down the stairs. I'm like, they're full of white people. Hey, but then this brothers <laughs> is jumping kind of great. I know. Uh -uh, I'm gonna go. Crazy. I got to the front door and the guard was like, yo, come in, man. It was so packed. And this Dang. dude was playing the dopest old school funk. And the dude just turns around to me. Said, you drinking? I said, yeah, pulled a shot. I went back there every night for about a week. And every time I got there, we didn't talk. He just poured me some shots. And then it was Friday night. Wow. He took up the microphone. He goes, can you rap? And I went, can I what? He goes, can you rap? Give me the mic. Give me the, give me the mic. Man, this man, this man did his pop. He, he, knew, he knew how to create stars. He just, this man different. He just, he a creator out here. He a real creator. Mr. Magoo, you may be blind, right but I can still see you. Like, I heard his voice before. That was the beginning of my friendship with Dennis Pop. This man, Dennis, different. Amongst other key employees was trainee producer and all round dog's body, Martin Sandberg. Martin so was Sandberg. Like, yeah, kind of the T boy. Dennis Slade. Yeah, but not in a bad way in that sense. No, he was he was uh, learning the trade. Yeah. Sandberg had come to the attention of Dennis Pop. My boy looked like Van Helsing. Yeah, metal yeah. band It's Alive. It's Alive were boisterous and blasphemous, but the real Martin Sandberg was awkward and shy. He <laughs> played heavy metal, but he also harbored a terrible secret. Martin Sandberg loved pop. In Dennis. Sandberg had found a kindred spirit. Dennis insisted Sandberg also take on a more poppy epithet, and so he was renamed. This Rename? here is Max Martin. That's a good one. Oh, that's a nice one. one. That's a nice one. No Max way. Ma so this man, Max Martin, was an artist? That's crazy. What in the world? This man, Dennis, popped this. This is how you know this man is a genius out here. You got to create. Like, can you do this? Let's do it. It's renamed. Just do it. He should have been in like. This here, it's Max Martin. That's a good one. That's a nice Max one. Martin. That's a nice one. That's crazy. Max got so many Max hits Martin out here. Max Martin was obsessed with melody. How did it work? What made some melodies catchier than others? It's a love he had first acquired in state-funded music school. Sure, I know we already at 15 minutes. I ain't gonna lie, I'm invested now. We watching the whole thing. Let's get it. Det är ju blir mer intresserad av brudar eller ishockey från jag liksom men skit i det liksom. Men jag satt och blåste min mögla trumpet. Tyckte det var ganska coolt ändå. Music has long been a key part of the Swedish education system. When Max was at school. He could learn almost any instrument he wanted for next to nothing. Talent. This state-funded initiative Gifted. allowed the brightest and best to blossom, perhaps partly explaining why Swedes are so dominant in the industry today. Is it a big part of the curriculum? Music education has always been quite important. I think everyone had to learn to play the flute and perhaps a guitar, and some people got tired of that. But some of them were Max Martins. Okay. Bringing swagger and groove Andreas. to the troupe was failed singer-songwriter Andreas Carlson. Okay, I've heard of Andreas too. I've seen his name on a couple of those uh, hit songs, the, the list thing that I did. I was kind of totally unaware of what I was getting myself into because here I am, I need one to be guitar, a no real dance moves, kind of looked like a boy band guy before <laughs> boy band had actually hit really big again. I understood that, you know, I'm not going to be an artist anymore. Well, the I'm Swedish Maxwell out here. And there was a bunch of, of people backstage 
one guy with blonde long hair that looked like a Viking, and a shorter guy <laughs> long hair that looked like a metal singer, which was Max Martin and Dennis Pop. And then I joined their team. Nice. He just put together a group of people that had really nothing to do with one another, and he created this gang of brothers, you. band of brothers. To hold That's the whole different. team together, Dennis brought along former Swemix office manager, Jeanette. I was like the supervisor, the I was manager. like the mom-ish. It's like a daycare center for semi-grown-ups. <laughs> and Never Never Land, is it, is it, was that the idea? Yeah. Sort of. If you change your mind, take a chance on the first thing you like. I heard As well that as running the office, yeah, Dennis also added backing singer to Jeanette's job description. When I'm singing, I'm adding something that maybe thickens. Okay. You're a thickener. I'm a thickener. Take ABBA, for instance. You have Agneta and you have Annifrid. Agneta has Abba, a really got them crisp, beautiful voice. Annifrid. She thickens it. They do sound good together. That's one thing you can say. They got some good stuff. Apple does. I'm a thicker. Take a chance on I don't me. really know how it happened. I was sitting by my desk. I was there. I was available. They knew I could sing. Jeanette, <laughs> come down to Studio One. Sing like this. Okay. I blended in well with all different kinds of voices. That's nice. Bass. And Britney. Dang, she got the sing on a Britney song. And That's Robin. Crazy. Robin. Okay, I heard from Robin before. And what's the, the English group? Boy band. Five. Five. Baby now. Five. We I did never heard whatever of we wanted musically. We experimented with sound. We took massive risks. Nah, Jonah, she was in this too? In the studio, the team searched for Dennis's perfect pop sound. They began by harking back to Swedish songwriting tradition. This is the ancient oh. art of culming, a herding call, with its simplistic melodies and an absence of oh, rhythm. Oh, they're just using culming the video. Culming is the root. I thought, I see Jonah Jen and stuff. I like her, uh, her, uh, her video and the content she make about uh, Sweden. I thought they had her in the studio. Of all Swedish folk okay. music. Swedish folk music is all about. Oh, she can still sing. And out of okay. that comes, I don't know how it. She I did that effortlessly. Sign, and it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. Dang. That's still. I was just watching Pitch Perfect the other day, and it's in, uh, I'll be jamming that off Pitch Perfect. Ace of Pace, Okay, they got them hits. They got them hits for real, for real. Saw the sign. The simplicity of Swedish folk melodies had an oddly universal appeal Dang. amongst the record-buying public, like ABBA. Dennis, an ace of bass, had thrust Swedish musical tradition into the global spotlight. We came in a gap. Mm. We are the only ones doing this melodic pop. And specifically in the States, it was a huge gap. It was only soul and it was uh, rap and hard rock. And we made mel melodies. That is true. But Dennis knew Swedish tradition alone would not keep the masses satisfied. By the mid 90s, commercial radio was awash with hip hop, R&B and dance. For the team at Sharon Studios to continue mm. to thrive, their music would ultimately have to get ahead of current trends. Dennis said, I ain't gonna lie, them early 2000s were different. Max, they hit the now a fully fledged man. producer in his own right, the task of writing the studio's next hit to be sung by a 16 year old Swede called Robin. Robin, Dennis is the flavor guy, the guy that played the new records for others. And Martin was the songwriter. They were like sucking in all this inspiration from dance music and mm. and and rock music mixed with like a sense of melody and just like putting it, it together, together in a way. Yeah. Okay, Robin. I think I heard one Robin song. I need to check her out. 
I'm checking out everybody that I see on here. That's gonna be my sweetest music age. I remember when we when we did Show Me Love and Martin played me that song for the first time. He said, you know, these beats, like I'm really happy with these beats. <laughs> I've been working on it from long. I think I cracked something. Like it, for him, it was like, this is it. I ain't gonna lie, he might have, cause that beat kind of sound like some of the Britneys and the other boy band beats. He said, I, I got the beat, the trap like, beats, like. What is it that he's referring to? Is it R&B or is it, like, for me, like, that's the, really his own interpretation of, I think, pop music, the way it was sounding at the time. Mm. I'll tell you, I can hear really it. impactful drops and, like, big pompous energy. I think I can hear some way, Britney Spears are in a there. little bit like the Japanese, like how we can get so obsessed with something and like try to recreate it or imitate mm. it in some way and then it never becomes what the original is. It becomes another maybe a little bit weirder and yeah, stranger <laughs> version of it. As the hits rolled off the Sharon production line, the studio now began attracting the attention of foreign record labels who wanted uh -huh. their artists to have that unique Sharon sound. That's what we were dreaming about, getting in with a big artist that could really mm -hmm. take our music to, to the top of the charts. Next level, who we got now? Who At is? first they were gonna be called The Lads. Got changed The Lads? <laughs> I've never heard Kirby of us. Uh... was sent to the UK by Dennis to meet with an ambitious young record label exec. So yeah, I've never Cal heard Paul of them. Flew me to England, Herbie darling. I had this uh, wonderful idea and I had this wonderful band. It was gonna be, it's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be wonderful. And we had Bye. just done Clap Your Hands. Clap your hands. Uh, Herbie. This is Clap Your Hands, an early experimental Sharon track written okay. by Herbie, Dennis and Max. It was soon to be transformed. I said to me, oh, well, I've got this idea, but it's, it's nuts. And he goes, well, what is it? <laughs> We need to connect the guys to some form of sports that connects them to guys, connects them to, in a different way. And he went, what about the NBA? So Ooh. I went back to Sweden, I told Dennis, and we created this slam dunk the funk. Slam dunk? I've never heard it. I've never heard of this group. That's surprising. That's a surprising group. It was a golden Five. age of manufactured boy bands and girl groups. Just by adding a backing no to thing. the lyrics, the track went stratospheric. Dang. Okay. It had a simple melody and it had great beats. And it this might have been on some movies in the 90s. I don't with know. the audience I through relatable them, faces though. as a front for Dennis's operation. What are we doing? 10 million albums? And we got the official Dang. song for the NBA. I'm never thinking small again. Oh, Oh, yes, Crucial sir. Crucial to Sharon's success was the idea that tracks should work as well on the radio as they did on the dance floor. In Each track was tested to destruction just in Stockholm's cold. clubs before official release. <laughs> just a tip of, like, cold with it. Dance floor. I'm a just, I like Each just track was tested cold. to destruction in Stockholm's clubs before official release, sometimes with over bigger 100 than the different versions. <laughs> we wouldn't tell anyone. <laughs> we just <laughs> tell the DJ, yo, can you play this if you get a chance? In sync. This is the frequency for radio. How do we get the most out of that? This is the frequency for clubs based on the amount of bass in there and the people in the club, how we will yeah. soak up the bass, not make the highs so high that it annoys people. Then you have to take into to reference that people are drinking so their senses are, da are dampened. <laughs> Man, they didn't say how they found in sync. You guys used to get a track sent out to LA to be driven around in a car to hear what it would sound like on, on a car stereo. Hell yeah! <laughs> they had to do this. The car test oh, was very important. Every time when we came to the States, we would work in the studio and then we would put the song in the car and then we would drive around and see how it felt. Dang. Oh, that's five again. I've never, that's crazy. I ain't know like, this. Wow. You know, in Sweden, it didn't sound like it should sound. Oh, Rather do than that hard science, Sweden. the LA car test was perhaps just another of Dennis's eccentricities. 
but it wasn't entirely without foundation. There's a very important reason why the tracks were sent out to Los Angeles rather than just being driven yeah, along you're the highway do that in Sweden. Sweden here. Let me put on the stereo and you'll see why. Bye, bye, bye. See out here, this just doesn't sound right. This no, on the every sound time. of snow in Sweden. This is the sound on of every time. going to the beach with your mates or hanging out at the mall. Of course, teenagers. Hey, you can do that in Texas too, right? With your window down, blasting American music. teenagers buy more music than anyone else. Dennis designed his songs to reflect American lives, at least as far as he understood mm. them, from his studio in faraway Stockholm. Underlying the fun and games at Sharon was always a methodical, systematic approach. Each new experiment brought the team ever closer to creating perfect pop. In time, this analytical process would transform into Dennis's greatest achievement yet. Was there a Sharon formula? Oh yeah. For example, every third chorus had a B hook. Dennis took mm. that from the name of the game with ABBA. What's the name of the game? Name it's of the, the game. name of the game. Which is the verse. Okay. And then he kind of made that connect with the last chorus. So it creates this enormous That's lift. Different. That's different. Oh, yes, I wanna know the name of the game. That's nice. It's actually That's two nice. choruses going against each other, and we use that for every song. Hold up, this sounds familiar. Is this five and again? There was a breakdown part after the second chorus. And then there was always a sound that would be a string wheel, which is, was a pad that sounded like a funeral. Oh, dang. And the manic shot, which was a As soon as there was a good sound, that sound went into the Sharon bank, you know. Um, so it, everything became very dressed in this unique Sharon sound. When you listen to those songs that came out of Sharon at the time, you know, it's not the sound of Volvos and saunas and Ikea and kind of stereotypical Swedish things. It's the sound of America? Well, I mean, we thought so. I mean, I heard Bills, Bills, Bills with Destiny's Child, and I thought, you know, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to come up with R&B songs that have, you know, titles with three words, and we wrote Bye, Bye, Bye. <laughs> That's crazy. I never knew that. Crazy. Smart. No titles with hey, three smart. words, and we wrote bye bye bye. Bye 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 bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. And that's that one of the biggest. Like Everybody know this. It sounds one. like something. It's got that Swedish rigid bye, everything bye, bye. perfect. It doesn't have a natural laid back R and B. I ain't feel never to seen it. that music it's, video. It's else. I'm too young. Dang, that's a hit. And even though we hold up when destiny child came out this is 2000 i thought they were before destiny child i thought destiny child was like oh one we're heavily in it might have been around the same American time and british music i think we came up with something that was british music quite unique the sharon formula was a distinctly H &M. swedish concoction by taking the best bits from elsewhere and repackaging them in a more pleasingly swedish fashion they were aping the tactics of other world-beating Swedish brands. Mm. There are parallels with the way IKEA or H&M operate because coming from Sweden, you don't invent that much maybe, but you sort of become very good at scanning the rest of the world and picking the best pieces yeah. and try to do a similar version, but in a more effective way. Okay. Sharon never stopped refining its formula. As time went on, the team enjoyed access to ever more exciting That's performers more 90s, to fund like. Dennis's musical vision. Step forward, the Backstreet Boys. Backstreet. Max and Dennis Dang. were responsible for the whole birth of Backstreet Boys. Our sound. Oh, wow. Um, I think even kind of helping us find ourselves within our image, within whatever encompassed the Backstreet Boys was Max and Dennis. Dang. Backstreet Boys, 95, Dang. From 1995. 
Nine, they, I knew that was the nine. They sound that was very nine. The Backstreet Boys had been a personal passion project for Max. On their debut album, he penned four tracks, scoring number two in the U.S. with "Quit Playing Dang. Games with My Heart." His sound was always transcending. You know, it was always ahead of the game. Everybody, yeah. Max's determination to make Backstreet a success was That's formidable, a as he demanded from the boys increasingly precise vocal performances. To layer over his ever simpler melodies. Well, they like the beats from Max, man. The singer was this thing. This freaking <laughs> hand, hand. This hand. Like, <laughs> there was a certain rhythm that you had that, that Max heard. And it was, if you were singing it like off or you were singing in your own rhythm, in your own way. It was always on top. Yeah. Max would say, no, 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 do it again. Right here. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> This man was like Kanye back in the day. He basically like, I don't know if y'all seen the Kanye West document. This man, probably beyond that, really. Fever spread from continent to continent. Fans braved the icy streets of Stockholm outside the pop laboratory Dang. where the band's sound was being crafted. I remember coming to the studio. Oh there would my be goodness. girls feigning, crying, you know, miserable, sleeping in <laughs> sleeping bags. Dang. And they were from Australia, America, England. They were just sitting outside of our studio, hoping that something was gonna happen. Wow. But as like, well as sculpting Backstreet back Sound, boy, that little did these fans know that the Sharon team were also responsible for writing the hits sung by arch rivals NSYNC, fronted by a young Justin Timberlake. Justin was different. Y'all better start playing with him. Was it him. easy to decide when you wrote a new track? Like, is it Backstreet? Is it NSYNC? Are there any borderline tracks? Is it Britney? Uh, I mean, all those <laughs> songs could have worked for anyone, really. Dang. Everyone there cares about the song. You know, you leave no stone unturned as the that saying been goes. A, to really find. I ain't gonna lie. That would have been a tough decision back in the day. That would have been a tough decision, but like you said, and what just give them, the throw it out best, there, you know, jump up and catch and melody and production for the song. Okay. You think about the music industry, birth of rock and roll, and you feel that the creativity laid with the artists. Then what you guys did we shift that creative power into the studio. We were the creators, and the artists became sort of the voices and, and the faces. Pretty much. I never wrote a lot of stuff for ABBA, too. That's crazy. We were a couple of kids that, you know, very quickly became wealthier than we were before. Money, money, money. Probably not unlike a rock band that all of a sudden have their first big hit record and they start buying cars and all of a sudden you move from cars to apartments and homes and yeah. flying first class. I mean, we Look kind of that. lost touch a little bit. As the hits continued to flow out racking Sharon, up racks. the money flowed in. The team were filthy rich, a potential source of social disapproval in Sweden. Dang. Having witnessed what happens to Swedes who flaunt their wealth, they were right to be concerned. Sweden is a funny country. We have something called Jantelå. <laughs> In Sweden, we have this Jante law that you're not supposed to be better than anyone else. Dang. In Sweden, Jante law is a social code that emphasizes the good of the community over the individual. It simmers under the surface Jantelå. of everyday living. Those who dare break Jante law can expect scorn. People can see you and you're very showing humble. off. Don't do that. That is a big law that we have that is hidden inside of us. You have to get across a barrier in Sweden, and that's the Janta law. In the press, we were described as a shame of Sweden. Wow. Um, I rather puke myself in the face and listen to his bass. Dang. But it didn't really concern us too much, even though, of course, it would have been nice. But <laughs> being number one in America was nicer. No, more money in America, I, I hope I didn't, but all music journalists did. They were definitely considered bad Swedes because they didn't care about the law of Jante. They sort of were uh, sort of pounding their chests and Dang. wanted to be seen as superstars. 
now Chiron was at its creative peak. The formula had become so effective that practically every melody they touched was transformed into a chart topper. In accordance with Yantelor, mm. the team stayed firmly in the background and kept on creating ever more perfect music. And they kept getting bigger the next and star bigger. On the That's crazy. Was now jetting in from Disney's Mickey Mouse Club. She would make the team utterly dominant in the global music market. Britney, Britney. Her name was Britney Jean Spears. Dang. She changed the game. I ain't gonna lie. Britney changed the game. I think we went to a cafe the first day and started talking about music and dreams and whatever. I remember first time hearing her singing. She looked very average. I thought, wow. how is this gonna work? Who's gonna like this? But she was nice and really quiet. Could you sense any star power there? No. Dang. But then we received the video. It was like, oh my God. Well, I know every Britney hit and I didn't even listen to Britney. There's probably mm, mm, sad mm, mm, ones that mm, mm, mm. you should be you should recognize a song after two seconds. I own everything. I knew Baby it this. One more time I knew it's a really good example of that. Yeah. I knew what that was off that ding, ding, ding. Recently drafted into the Sharon team was Jürgen Ellefsen. Jürgen knew exactly how to write Jürgen. almost any target audience, thanks to years of music biz experience of a sort as a jingles writer. I fit them like a glove because I did jingles for, you know, commercial radio. One day you did some China restaurant and the next day you did a, you know, car repair or a hard rock song, you know, whatever. <laughs> Dang. The first time I came to the Sharon one one night, and there was nobody there except Dennis who opened the door. And he said, "Oh, hi, man, come on in." And then he's like, he, he shook my hand, and I felt it felt really strange. It's like, whoa, <laughs> that was an, that was an important handshake. Hey, Britney had them hits. We made that eight is, songs that's from crazy. that first Britney album. Like, you know, when you poke an ant pile, you know, suddenly, suddenly there's a lot of movement in the studio. We were like three teams competing on the inside, but facing the outside, the world. We wanted to win together. Max would walk in between and, okay, I like Drive Me Crazy. Maybe you'll refine it, you know, a little bit like that, a like, little bit like this. And then Jürgen had Sometimes, which was a huge hit. Sometimes I love you. Sometimes I hide. Oh no, it's a I little different. One. And then me and Christian had written Born to Make You Happy. Even though the, the three teams yeah. took them a little bit differently, That's crazy. it was the Sharon sound in the middle. And that's what the record companies wanted. Yeah, Britney was a star. Those early Britney Spears tracks is like a milestone in music history. Ah, Britney kind of ran those early 2000s. I was something really changed. Everybody knew Britney Spears. It was almost a crime not to know her. That very effective song, the way it was constructed, I think, has influenced all pop music coming since then. Me, baby, one more time. They basically took the choruses from like hair metal, from like Bon Jovi and Def Leppard, mm -hmm. those very mm. big choruses. And they put them in like a context with production influenced by hip hop and house I mean, music. Mr. Dunn. And no one sort of did that. So by mixing those two, a sort of an unthinkable thing. I think yeah. no one in, in the States or Great Britain would have ever done that because it was uh, considered bad taste. As a <laughs> Swede, you could do that. Baby, one one more more time. Time. Baby One More Time went to number one in every country that it was released. Apart from Iceland, for some reason. Yeah. Not Iceland. This was the Late culmination tribute. of Dennis's life's work. He had brought together a team capable of creating his perfect pop sound. And the sound of modern that. pop as we know it today. 
an inexplicably Swedish mishmash of influences, laser-focused to attract the maximum number of listeners. The Chiron formula crafted in this pop laboratory seemed infallible, but just as Britney Spears, mm -hmm. its most potent product yet, was exploding on our screens, her creators would suffer a devastating personal loss. Oh, no. He said, uh, it's not good. And I knew. Everything's in slow motion. It was like somebody who gives you everything, gives you the best of them, teaches you everything they know. It's telling you they're leaving now and they're not coming back. Dang. It came as a shock. I mean, he was 34 years old, and I just heard that he had this aggressive tumor in his Ooh. stomach. And um, the first thing that hit me, I thought it was so unfair. I mean, we live in Sweden Dang. with, like, the best health care you can have. I mean, we have the best doctors. But it kind of, we kept on working anyway. That's what he wanted us to do anyway. And then one day I was sitting in the office and... As I think about it, I've seen this dude before somewhere. I've seen you him see before this on guy American TV. It's Dennis, and he's just so thin, you know, he's lost Dang. so many kilos. Hey, Andreas, how are you, you know? You want to listen to some new music that I'm working on? So he takes me into the editing room, and, and he starts playing this, like, really weird music. And I said, what is this? What is it? Oh, this is what I'm going to do next. Wow, I never heard anything like it. We had him for a couple, couple of more weeks, maybe two or three weeks, and then he Dang. passed away like that. On the 30th of August, wow. 1998, Dennis Pop died, aged just 35. Wow. It was like a mirror shattering. It was just, everyone just collapsed. Dang. It became very clear Cancer ain't no joke was the one who was gonna take us through all of this because we had a record to make and that was the Backstreet Boys Millennium album. That was gonna be the record of records. Every song was gonna be a hit. Straight after the funeral, we went into the studio and created what I think is still a masterpiece. Show me the meaning of being lonely. Did it change the music that you wrote? No, no. Why? It's not about us. Music wasn't there. It wasn't about us. It would be mm. selfish of us to start writing songs based on something that's happened to us. That's true. There's this misconception that Show Me the Meaning of Being Lonely was written about Dennis. Show me the meaning of being lonely. It wasn't written about Dennis. A way of saying thank you, Dee, for everything. We'll miss you. Dang. That's what have you. Yeah, I swear. Dang, I knew. I knew it was something. It's always something. Something tragic happens in a, a stardom type. These type of documentaries always something tragic. Dang. You like this man changed my life. Just found me and told me to rap in the club. The sales are higher that than ever. You've one. got Britney, Backstreet Boys. Did it feel like a contradiction? Felt like an insult. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that this dude who just done all of this is gone and business as usual? All right. <laughs> Dang, that's crazy. The creativity it didn't come from the same place anymore. What Dennis had stood for, the culture and the joy and the playfulness, wasn't really there. We were kind of delivering like a factory. Dang. I could definitely feel how the mood shifted in the studio. We have to remember the sadness is also quite beautiful. The minor keys you can do more things with. You can actually mm -hmm. have a happier melody in a minor key. When you do that right, you get you end up with songs like uh, The Winner Takes It All, for instance. Winner Takes It All. That's a good one. I like that. Which sounds like pretty much a happy anthem, but it's actually the saddest thing in the world. Uh. Amid the difficult atmosphere, 
The Sharon team oh, continued yeah. to compose simple melodies, just as Dennis had taught them. Um. Jürgen carved a niche, harnessing the power of sadness. He wrote three UK number ones for Louis Walsh's latest oh, act, wow. Westlife. We Westlife. It was about a sense of melancholy, but also a sense of hope at the same time. I ain't gonna lie, them sad medallies, they, they were a big a thing, big deal. creates a tension, which makes you feel good, but it also reaches your heart. Westlife. Okay, I ain't heard this. Movie Just happy, happy. It doesn't really go in there, you know? It makes it more like, yeah, he's cool, you know? But to hit your heart, it needs to have something else. There needs to be some sort of a sadness, but it doesn't mean sadness in a sort of boo-hoo way. Yeah, that's true. You look at like the National Happiness Index mm -hmm. and how Sweden oh, stacks in up against all these other countries, and pretty much you're always coming out on top as one of the happiest nations on the planet. Hmm. They must have rigged it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the music that Swedes love has got sadness at its heart. Yeah. It's just a mi mindset of the people, I think. There's some sort yeah. of a, I don't know, some sort of a minor key. So I a okay, where's life? I think it's an inner strive that's within the whole soul of Sweden. There's a longing, an inner longing to reach out, to communicate. The guys who did Spotify probably really applied that, you know, to, to make it that grow that quickly. And, and the same with IKEA and H&M and all the other multinational Swedish companies. That is true. That is Earth true. Mars lander report status, please. In Sharon's brave new post-Dennis world, Max Martin was now in charge creatively. Fresh talent was this moved man, to Max keep the running. The new kid on the block was sampling wizard Rami Yacoub, who joined after being spotted by his new mentor, Max. Mm. Rami's addition to the Sharon family came as a surprise to some. Nobody told anybody that I started working there. First week, I walked around and everyone was looking at me kind of weird. I was like, who is this guy? And I was like, why are they looking at me? <laughs> Ooh, Just to be in that, in that was place was amazing. Oh, I believe everything happens for a reason. But I think in the end, we all still had the, you know, you know, tennis rooted deep in, in us. Um, the Sharon factory continued to churn out hit after hit with breathtaking efficiency. Britney but had them hits. Man, Max found the extra attention on him to be increasingly tough. Dennis was quite secretive from the beginning, and I think it rubbed off. Hey, Max. Max preferred to let his melodies do the talking. Everything. Man, I feel I see why Max is so driven and you know dedicated. I didn't know I didn't know Dennis Pop was the one that got him started. Man, I'm glad I watched this. I'm glad I'm watching this because Max pen is heavy. But you know, there's always someone peeing was heavier. Process Put it you on. Found within the music itself. In Sharon's final years, he gave fewer and fewer interviews until he stopped giving them entirely. Mm. The producers who came up in Sweden with Sharon, they considered it their job. We should not be seen. We should be in the background. Our job is to make stars of like Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be stars in our own right. And there's also, I think, a quite Swedish mentality. It's like the exact opposite of the American thing, where you should Very always opposite. sort of boost yourself and exaggerate. The Swedish way is, no, no, no. It was yeah, the end I'm, of the I'm road for the world's number credit. one hit machine. From a basement in Stockholm, Sharon Studios had achieved global domination. But its founder was gone, and with Aim. him, the very life and soul of the organization. In death, Dennis could no longer make music for the masses, but his disciples could. Now they would go their separate ways to continue spreading Dennis's gospel. At the hey, end of man, that Dennis. year, we said probably we should just close this place and, and move on. Eight guys at the top of everything. It's kind of like the Beatles, you know? They have it all and then they do one little performance on the rooftop and that's it. Dang, Hollywood. 
Oh, it's now he got to Max see Martin Max. now lives in Los Angeles, and he's by far and away the most successful songwriter of his and almost every other generation. At his new venture, MXM Studios, Max has surrounded himself with Dang. an army of Swedes, each specializing in different smart, areas of smart. the songwriting process. It's a thoroughly Swedish environment, encouraging collaboration and cross pollination of ideas. The lessons handed down from Dennis to Max are still an important part of the curriculum at MXM. And for the last 18 years, Max and his team have been turbocharging the Chiron formula into a theory they call melodic math. There is a code mm. for taste. There is a code that connects everyone. And I think Max, he's cracked that human code when it comes to pop songs. Oh, I hate. I'll tell you this, man. That's one thing when it comes to really learning, sitting down, and you learning, learning from the greats to become great. I'm telling you, this is what this man did. Like, my guy really learned Melodic and math, took over. You want every part in the song to have a distinct melody. Dang. And Taylor Swift be jamming. I ain't gonna lie. It's Taylor really Swift simple. Is... It's melody math That's major. and phrasing math. But at least we'll both be beautiful mm -hmm. to stay forever young. For example, if you have the a weekend. chorus, generally you don't want the chorus notes to be revealed in the verse or the pre-chorus. You want it to feel fresh when it comes in. She told me you'll never be I and that's when the weekend had them dreads, whatever and that also is. This chord is like bam, 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 bam. You don't want the verse to go bam, 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 maybe bam, bam, like so it feels new. Yeah. Hey, yeah, hot thing. You're hot thing. You're cool. Yes, thing you know. His melodies are so incredible and so sophisticated, but simple. Um, but he is very. Um, very specific when it comes to vocals mm -hmm. and a bit of a task master. <laughs> I that used to jam. I ain't gonna lie. Katy Perry had them hits too. I ain't gonna lie. I think Max. Oh, you wrote the that for just like an instrument. There's a certain way. Boy, they still play everywhere. Every Justin Timber. This song plays on everything since it came out, still to this day. And Justin Timberlake been. That guy since the it, 90s is crazy. To sing certain songs that is going to be even catchier and even hookier. Uh, that's pretty, pretty catchy. Happy song. Everybody used that one. I ain't we gonna did lie. ask Max Martin for an interview. He responded by saying he preferred all the attention to go on the songs and the artists. It's hard to overstate the importance of Max Dang, to one my boy, He's the third most successful songwriter of all time behind only Lennon and McCartney. Got 22 US wow. number ones to his name, yet most people have never even heard of him. But in 2016, in this building behind me, Stockholm's concert hall, he was finally coaxed out of hiding by the Swedish king Carl Gustaf. Dang. This is the moment that the sound of modern pop was given the royal seal of this approval. Man, dang. When Max Martin was awarded the Polar Music Prize, Sweden's musical That's version of the Nobel Prize by His Royal Highness King Carl Gustav the 16th. Previous winners have included Bob Dylan, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Stevie. and Paul McCartney. He's one of a kind. He will be remembered as a Mozart, you know, one of the, the greatest uh, composers of the century. That's what's up, man. Dang. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Excellences, Ladies and Gentlemen, and the Polar Music Prize Jury. Well, you did it. <laughs> you blew my cover. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to hide between two speakers in a basement for over 20 years. Dang. And then you did this. I have to start with the late Dennis Pop. Sure, it's like it's like, hey man, with all these hits, you got we gotta see he your may face now. You did this. I have to start with the late Dennis Pop. He made me realize how difficult it is to make things sound simple. Mm. 
Meanwhile, Dennis's other disciples continue to preach the good word. Herbie has recently penned hits for Rita Ora and Zayn Malik, but his heart still lies in the sound of the underground. Okay. Underground. Hear that? Hear that? Okay. This is good. This is very well produced, I think. He jamming. <laughs> That's how you know you jamming that. That's how and he knew that. That's that was an good. epic ballad writer for Simon Cowell's reality TV franchises. Does it have Simon its own unique challenges? Jingle making <laughs> came into play because it was not just a song. It was the end of a TV show. It was a moment that needed to be, you know, crowned somehow. Evergreen. I don't think I heard this. Mm -hmm. Oh, they got and Academy Andreas of Music. has found happiness by opening his very own music school. That is dope. Look at this place. Right? We wanted to create this uh, cool. unique world for the students. I think it's on me to kind of do something good. Success means nothing unless you share it with other people. That's true. That's true. Hey, hey, Rami that's has carved his own name in the industry, writing for One Direction, Ariana Grande, and Madonna. Oh, nice. But now, got some names 13 years it. after parting ways with his mentor, Rami has recently moved to LA to be reunited with Max Martin. Okay. It's been almost 13 years since I worked with Max. First thing he said, too, is like, welcome back to the family. We have that's a lot nice. of Swedes in LA. It's very much a Swedish community. Like, we don't melt. You know, with the rest, I need to uh, go to LA. we kind of stick to our bubble and try to make the team under the roof as strong as possible so we can just do it all ourselves. I say how you say and, uh, how we stay how you look so pretty. Tovlo. Yeah. Tovalo is part of the next Tovalo. generation of LA-based Swedes. She's a performer oh, and nice. one of an increasing number of female songwriters in a corner of the industry traditionally oh, dominated I thought she had by one of the Muppets in the car with her. <laughs> Swedes. She's a member of Wolf Cousins, the new songwriting oh, collective created by Max Martin in oh, Sharon's nice. image. Wolf Cousins is a Cousin. kind of joint collaboration between me and eight other Swedish dudes. I've written with Ellie Golding, Girls Aloud, Saturdays, nice. Cholix X, Lord, a lot of girls. <laughs> nice. Tovalo. I got to hear one of her songs, I believe. Like, if you'd ask me when I was 14, 15, if I thought a 40 year old man could tell me what I thought and, or how I felt, I'd be like, no, you have no idea. <laughs> Anything <laughs> of what I've been through. Um, but in a way, obviously, they did know. I like that it's changing. There's so many female producers that are popping up everywhere and we can use yeah, our voice, you know, we're same age, we have the same experiences, we can actually mm -hmm. tell the story like it is. That's her song? I know that, I heard that before. I didn't know that was Tova As Dennis Pop's baton is passed down huh. to another generation, the seemingly no end song. to new That's theories crazy. on why the miracle of modern pop happened in Sweden. Perhaps it was the perfect storm of bad weather and stellar musical education. Combined with Yantalor, a love of simple melodies, and a curious knack for reformulating the best ideas from other nations and selling it back to them. Dang. This was good. In truth, all of these this things are important, good. but maybe it's because Dennis Pop, a man who loved all things pop so much he changed his name, had an uncanny ability to recognize a hit sound. Mm. He inspired the team he created with his vision and his ambition, and they in turn will continue this to pass good. on the baton. Dang. 20 years after his death, Dennis Pop's legacy shows no sign of ending. It's my life. Dang, this was good. I'm glad I got to watch this, man. I know I was I was supposed to put this in parts, but shoot. It started getting good. Like I like 
I like documentaries and stuff like that. I'm one of those ones. But man, Dennis Pop changed the game. Hey, he passed the torch to Max Martin. I thought Max Martin would just hey every greatness always followed by something, you know. There was always somebody great, or they usually somebody great, they learned from somebody that was great to them. It's always passed on, you know. So we see what's following what's now gonna follow Max Martin later, you know, but greatness is always passed down, you know. Somebody learned from somebody. So it just wants it makes you wonder, man, who did my guy Dennis Pop learn from? But then again, it gotta start somewhere and it's passed along, I feel. Like what's the name my guy said, you know. Success is much better when you get to share it with others. But that's all I have. Appreciate whoever sent me this twenty times. This was a good documentary. Y'all make sure y'all hit that subscribe button, send down those recommendations. Y'all be blessed, be the best and be you. I'm out.